polymer chemistry. In this short lesson we'll look at silicones, their preparations, their properties, and some of their applications. Silicones also known as polysiloxanes. So Dow Corning, GE, Union Carbide, ever heard of those? Silicone elastomers and sealants for high temperature applications. Do you recall what an elastomer is? So an elastomer, recall from our first lessons definitions, they are rubbers that can be stretched to at least twice their original length and returned to approximately their original length when the stress is relieved. So here's an example of a silicone elastomer, a silicone tubing, certainly the most versatile tubing available in several respects. And here is a silicone sealant, a caulking material. We'll start with that. So the monomer is prepared from tetrachlorosilane and a Grignard reagent. In a substitution reaction, a methyl group, that is a methide, from the Grignard replaces a chloride from the tetrachlorosilane, producing trichloromethylsilane. This is a trifunctional monomer. Then that reacts further. Another molecule of Grignard again displaces a chloride, giving us dichloro dimethylsilane. This should be a difunctional monomer, as I will show shortly. After a third addition of Grignard, we'll get chlorotrimethylsilane. And after a fourth addition, not necessarily desired here, we'd wind up with tetramethylsilane, which isn't really usable as a monomer to produce polymer. So a 2 to 1 ratio of a Grignard to tetrachlorosilane would produce mostly difunctional dichlorodimethylsilane monomer. And then this would be the mixture produced would be fractionally distilled to separate the components. The R group in the Grignard is typically either methyl or phenyl. Now I mentioned that this is a substitution reaction. And as a good organic chemist, you should be scratching your head a bit and saying, now wait a minute. The substrate here, tetrachlorosilane, what's the degree of substitution on it? Well, there are no alkyl substituents, but there already are four chlorines on it. Hmm. Do you recall, in substitution reaction with carbon, using a strong base, good nucleophile, like a Grignard reagent, whose pKb is approximately minus 41, you get SN2 reaction with a methyl carbon, Likewise, with the primary, but in the case of a secondary or tertiary, because the backside of the secondary or tertiary carbon is blocked and the nucleophile can't strike it, what happens instead? A strongly basic nucleophile will abstract hydrogen on a beta carbon, wind up instead with elimination reactions. And certainly we don't get any reaction at all with a quaternary. So just mix that together with what we're trying to understand here. It doesn't sound quite right, does it? Here we have a tetrachloro silicon, and we're saying there's a substitution reaction, which isn't what we'd normally expect. But silicon is not carbon. Silicon actually has much longer bonds than carbon, and the very reason that silicon doesn't form all types of polymers and all types of compounds that carbon does. Its bonds are longer and, in fact, weaker. So in fact, substitution reactions will occur. And let me kind of sketch one out here. Let's say we have tetrachlorosilane. And we'll react that with the Grignard methyl magnesium chloride. That's a carbanion, right? Indeed, we believe that a SN2 type reaction does occur, substituting 
the methide for the chloride. And this will give us basically MgCl2 byproduct. And that's trichloromethylsilane. And the steps would just again repeat themselves over and over. Now we haven't actually got very far yet. Um, so we create, combine a two to one ratio of the uh, green yard with the tetrachlorosilane. And we get mostly difunctional monomer. All right, so the polymerization, um, it's bulk polymerization and hydrolysis is the way it goes. So, so water molecules replace chlorides in the same way that the uh, alkydes did from the Grignard. Here, I'll just show one example or one step here. So here is a dialkyl dichlorosilane, and it reacts with a water molecule in a substitution reaction. I'll call it SN2. Chloride is removed. I'll wind up with. An intermediate here, a protonated alcohol. And then in the final step, let's give this some intermediate appearance. All right, deprotonation gives a byproduct HCl, and we have a silanol. Not a very good drawing here. All right, and that occurs twice because we have two molecules of water producing the silane diol, which I've shown down here. So this is a dialkyl silane diol, and it looks like this that I have here on the far left. The diols will spontaneously react with each other, condensing out water to give us the linear polysiloxane, the silicone polymer, SiO, SiO, SiO in the main chain, dialkyl on the side chain. So that's the silicone. Now, in order to use this, um, we want to stop the polymerization at least the manufacturer does, and put it in a tube and send it to us so that we can f complete the polymerization in our application. We don't want to buy the rubber, we want to buy the, the gel liquid that we can squeeze out of the tube. And so he caps it. Using sodium acetate, at some point in the polymerization, the polymerization is stopped by adding sodium acetate, and sodium acetate will cap um, these end silol groups. Just again a substitution reaction, giving us acetate end groups. And that stops the polymerization. See here we see the low molecular weight polymer with the acetate ester end groups on it. And it's packaged in this fashion. So before polysiloxane reaches high molecular weight, the reaction is halted by the addition of sodium acetate. And then the acetate groups replace the hydroxyl group that's our cap and cap the end of the polymer and this in this condition polysiloxane is stable for months if protected from the atmosphere in a tube so in this fashion it's stable in the tube for quite a number of months after you purchase it as long as you don't open it to let the air in now how does it cure how do we actually make the polymer in application so on exposure to moisture from the air or water so once we open the tube and squeeze it out the 
acetate end groups are hydrolyzed back to the hydroxyl groups and the polymerization resumes until a high molecular weight is attained. So here we have moisture, presumably from the air, replacing the acetate end groups. Right? And the, the acetate being the conjugate base of acetic acid will deprotonate this water that was added giving a, a neutral silol end group and a liberating acetic acid. So acetic acid is liberated as polymerization proceeds and if you ever used silicone you'll notice that the odor of vinegar is quite distinct in the air. You can actually um, use silicone underwater because it is moisture cure so yes it will cure the only problem is it generally won't stick to the surface that you're trying to seal to say the leak in your pool because it needs to be dry to make this to make the seal so although it's it's a moisture cure you still need a dry surface where the contact occurs if you want to do some kind of bonding or adhesion all right so some of the applications if we want in fact an oil an oil would be a low molecular weight linear silicone polymer, then we want to limit the extent of polymerization. It's got to be thinner than what comes out of a silicone caulking tube. So the manufacturer mixes a small amount of monofunctional units. Trimethyl monochloral silane monomer is added and that limits the molecular weight and we get a silicone oil. Silicone oils are, have the consistency of an oil. They have the advantage of being high temperature. So we use them for high temperature applications, for example, determining a melting point in a thiel tube. Or silicone oils are used as a lubricant as aircrafts. They're the oil of aircraft engines because of their high temperature resistance and longevity. I guess you pay the money where it counts. So back to our silicone thermosets, rubbers, elastomers. Molecular weights greater than 50,000 grams per mole, um, incorporating variable amounts of a trifunctional monomer that will allow cross-linking. So you could simply use uh, methyl trichlorosilane, a small quantity of that, or sometimes a vinyl silicone monomer is used, and then a peroxide catalyst for cross-linking the vinyl groups. I don't appreciate the significant difference between the two, but either one gives you the addition of cross-link. And so, of the cross-linked thermoset silicone elastomers and rubbers and sealants, they're typically divided into two types. We have HTV, which stands for High Temperature Vulcanizing. Vulcanizing literally means curing. These will cure at about 170 Celsius. Perhaps you've seen this if you've done car repairs. Anyway, this is a high temperature curing silicone. Here a person is using it to repair a cracked cork gasket on a valve cover gasket. But you can replace the cork entirely with silicone if you wish. Which looks like an EGR valve. Um, and again, the person is using high temperature silicone, which will cure on, on contact with the engine. For room temperature applications, we use what's called RTV, room temperature vulcanizing, and so it cures at room temperature. And to accomplish that, they add a catalyst such as Stannis octoate, and this accelerates the reaction. The alkyl groups in these dialkyl silicones are typically either methyl groups that are said to impart low surface tension and high water repellents, Hence, we have silicone waxes that make the water on your car beat up. Polydimethylsiloxane, shown down here, polydimethylsiloxane. Or phenyl groups, which also impart water repellents as well as high temperature stability. And here we have polydiphenyl silicone. Let's take a look at some applications here. Here are some silicone based car waxes. Notice the high water repellents imparted to the wax by the silicone. Here is silicone water guard. 
waterproof your canvas, shoes, and boots. Waterproof your tent. Here's a, a textile with a silicone waterproofing on it, even waterproofing the surface of brick. So page 113 to summarize the properties of polysiloxanes, silicone oils we discussed, low freezing points, and low temperature coefficient of viscosity. That means it doesn't change its viscosity much with temperature. It doesn't thicken up very much when cold. It doesn't thin out very much when hot. Important properties, um, particularly for an aircraft engine. Silicone rubbers and elastomers. Lowest low temperature flexibility. Glass transition temperature minus 130 degrees Celsius, meaning it will not go brittle until below minus 130 Celsius. It is said to be the most flexible material known. Excellent high temperature stability. Uh, they are polar yet hydrophobic, one interesting combination. So in the main chain we have the very polar silicon oxygen bonds yet surrounded by nonpolar alkyl groups. It's non-flammable, they're chemically re resistant. Completely transparent to ultraviolet light. In fact, I've seen on the casings of some caul silicone caulkings it says 50 year UV resistance. I've even seen one that says 100 year. Not that anybody's going to collect on that and save their receipt. They are non toxic, they're environmentally safe. They have uh, low tensile strength, so nothing's perfect. They have little, to, if any, structural value. And they are expensive, $2 to $6 a pound. For the applications, uh, perhaps we can look at pictures while I read this to you. Since I have it right here, um, these are good dielectrics. So here are the spark plug wires on an automobile. The insulation is silicone because of its high dielectric capability and high temperature resistance. All right. Um, Hydraulics applications include, we've mentioned hydraulic fluids and heat exchange fluids we've mentioned for high temperature melting point determination. Water repellent coatings as you see here. Car polishes, waterproof sealers even for brick. Greases and waxes. Good dielectric for uh, auto ignition wires as shown here. For gaskets and sealants. Uh, room temperature vulcanizing caulking, mold release agents we've discussed, even heart valves, and no cholesterol oils for deep frying. This picture shows a microcapillary gas chromatography column, as we would use in the lab, and it shows the chemical structure of the coating. So it's this polysiloxane, dialkyl polysiloxane. This one has dimethyl groups and diphenyl groups. The particular one shown is called an HP5, and the 5 stands for the fact that it's 5% diphenyl and therefore 95% dimethyl polysiloxane. It's a good all round column for, for separation of low polarity compounds by gas chromatography. And finally, let's look back at this last application here Super Balls and Silly Putty. Uh, what an amazing polymer polysiloxanes, in fact, are.